Why, hello there. Are you here to listen to a scary story? Perhaps you just happened to stumble upon my channel. Well, my name is Danny Dreadful, and that's what I do here. I tell creepypasta, classic horror, and sometimes I even sprinkle in a little true paranormal. If that all sounds good to you, then why not stay and hit that subscribe button? If you're already subscribed, well, then welcome back, my beautiful creepy people. Tonight's stories are creepy and crawly. I needed to get the help of my friend to tell them. So, without further ado, grab your blankets, grab your whiskey, wine, or coffee, whichever you prefer, and let's get into tonight's tales. Tonight's stories are featuring Project Zero Cram. I found it sticking out of my neck about two months ago. I was standing in front of my bathroom mirror when I saw it. It was roughly the size of a quarter and as thick as the tip of my thumb. It was bright red, veiny, and had a couple of small white hairs growing out of it. It didn't really hurt, but it was very itchy. Scratching it made the whole area around it red, but it felt good. It was a very ugly little boil, but it wasn't causing me any kind of trouble. Last year, I got a bad cut on my knee, and it got infected, but after a while, the infection went away on its own, so I wasn't concerned. I've never been a very clear person. The thing kind of looked like a bug bite, but I never saw any bugs in my home. The morning after, I woke up to find three new bumps. One was on the back of my knee, one was on my elbow, and the last one was on the bottom of my big toe. Looking again at the mirror, I noticed the one on my neck had become bigger. The thin little veins pulsing on it had grown and started to become black. It was almost like a little miniature egg. I also noticed that near the top of my back, there was a giant red spot that looked almost like sunburn between my shoulder blades. At that moment, I was really glad I lived alone. If I had a wife or roommate, they might make me go to the doctor or a hospital. I hate those places. They're so sterile and lifeless. And I don't like being put to sleep, so some people I don't know can poke and prod me. Looking back on it now, maybe going to the hospital would have been a good idea. But the worse my condition grew, the more I hated being outside. My body was having all kinds of problems, at least a couple of new ones every day. First, my skin became very rough and dry. Lotions and creams didn't really work too well. They were all too intense, and they made my skin burn. They left it red, hard, and cracked when I wiped them off. That wasn't good. The areas where I scratched my bug bites were already swollen and oozing, and they weren't clearing up at all. I gave up on the lotions because I certainly didn't need any more problems. My back ached just about all day, every day. I couldn't tell if the pain was coming from my muscles or my spine, but the pain was sharp and hot, like a bunch of needles or knives were stuck inside of me. The pain made it very hard to stay still for very long, and moving seemed to make it feel better. So, I'd spend the entire day pacing around and not getting anything done. Hair was a big problem for me. All the hairs on my body were very itchy and irritated. These little, squishy white clumps would appear out of nowhere and get tangled up in the hair on my head, my back, and my armpits. So, I just shaved it all off. And that solved the problem. It was weird how easy it was to remove the hair, and I didn't even feel it. My fingers seemed to grow longer each day. Well, I guess growing isn't the right word. They were becoming very lanky and slender. It was more like they were being stretched. But even though my fingers were growing, they seemed to leave my fingernails behind. The skin and flesh of my fingers were growing over my nails, making it look like they were shrinking or getting shorter. 
But actually, they were the same length, just falling inside me. Eventually, my nails were completely engulfed. My mouth was always so dry when I woke up in the morning, and as hard as I would try, it would never get much better all throughout the day. I drank lots of soda, but it didn't help. The good thing was the soda started tasting better and better. I always had a sweet tooth, but for some reason, I like sugar more than ever now. I kept getting these weird cravings for food. For safety reasons, I always cooked my meat well done, but now I had cravings for rare meat. Very pink in the middle. Almost bleeding. They have this thing called blue rare meat. It's where you cook the meat only until it looks cooked on the outside, but the inside is completely red. I liked it a lot. Beef and chicken tasted really good like this, but pork was the best. I also had cravings for fish, particularly oysters. Anything that had a strong scent, like aged cheese or strong meat, really tasted good to me. One night, I smelled the garbage and it smelled so good to me, so I ate out of it. It tasted pretty good. The bites were still a big problem. I'd get at least two or three new ones every single day. I loved to scratch them, it felt really good, and all the muscles in my body would tense up and relax when I did it. I had to start taking it a bit easy, because the scratching was starting to make my head fuzzy. I mostly scratched while lying in bed, because scratching made me dizzy, and would often cause me to fall down. The redness would never go down. My whole body was covered in splotches now. Even though the big hairs, head, armpits, legs on my body weren't growing back, I was getting tiny little new hairs all over my body. They were very short and almost always stood up like the hackles on a dog's back. I like rubbing my fingers through them and it had a nice little tingly feeling. One day, I woke up and my tongue felt really, really weird. It felt big, awkward and lumpy like it didn't belong in my jaw. I opened my mouth and it came out tumbling. It was three times longer than it was yesterday and it was forked at the ends like some sort of lizard's tongue. I had to roll it up like a hose to get it to fit in my mouth now, and I had to hold my jaw tightly shut to keep it from falling out. It kinda hurt a little. My mother always said I was about as sharp as a rock, and I guess she was right. I hadn't gone to the hospital this whole time, and now I was pretty sure it was too late. I didn't really have a good grasp on how much time had passed by this point, just a general idea. My complexion was never that great. I was always a pretty pale guy. But it started getting so much worse. My skin was losing color. It slowly started to fade into a pale white color, and then it became light gray. Eventually, it was a dark gray. My skin was very hard and leathery, almost like a lizard. The good thing was, I didn't have to worry about the bites anymore. They were all gone. I ran a rock from my yard against my skin, and it couldn't break it. The rock actually started to erode a little bit. Emerging from my shins and upper arms were these little black pinchers that were very hard. They almost felt like they were made out of bone, but a hollow material, like a chicken bone. My fingers had become incredibly sharp and pointy at the end, sharp enough to cut glass. I couldn't make a fist anymore, or I would risk poking my palms and cutting myself. Something bizarre started happening to my mouth. It puckered up and grew longer, forming this weird sucker thing. My tongue could stick out of my mandible, sort of like an anteater. My weird food cravings became worse and worse, and now I was waiting for food to turn black and smelly before I ate it. It tasted really good when it aged. I didn't even notice at the time, but it was becoming harder to close my eyes. They were growing wider and wider, and my eyelids were completely retracted at all times. 
I couldn't blink both eyes at the same time anymore. I had to blink each eye individually. Eventually, my eyes grew big and bulged out of my face, like golf balls. They were a thick black color. It didn't impair my vision, but it sure did feel odd. The little black spikes that were growing all over my body had now begun to combine into a rough, scaly armor-like surface that covered most of me. Thousands of tiny little hairs started protruding out from all of it, forming a fur-like pelt all over my body. A pair of tall, lean, fuzzy antennas stuck up from the top of my head, and my ears were completely encased by the black, scaly substance. I looked in the mirror, and I didn't like what I saw. I smashed the mirror with my hand, but my hand didn't bleed. I did get a small little cut on one of my exposed parts of my arm, but whatever came out of me, it wasn't blood. It was a thick, brown, sticky substance that could not be washed. The one good thing that came from all of this was that I became much more flexible. I was able to slide under surfaces and through slender openings that I couldn't make it through before. I liked to crawl in the heating vents and slide around inside them like a slug. I could see through the vents into the other people's apartments. I liked to spy on my neighbors a bit, see what they were talking about or what they were doing. It might sound bad, but it was one of the only fun things about my condition. There was this beautiful lady in the apartment across from mine. I liked to watch her full laundry and sleep. Last night, I may have taken it a bit too far. I snuck into her apartment and sat on her chest. I wanted to be nice and close to her, to feel a real human again, to run my hand against her soft skin and understand what it was like to be a normal person. Just then, the oddest little urge came over me. I stuck my tongue out and began to lick her neck. Then, by accident, I seemed to have stung my tongue into the flesh of her neck, like my tongue was a scorpion tail or something. It didn't hurt her, and she didn't wake up, so I never got in trouble. Still, I'm a little bit concerned, because once I dragged my tongue off her, I noticed a little bump on her neck. It was about as thick as my thumb used to be, and roughly the size of a quarter. It was veiny and had little white hairs growing out of it, just like the one I had. It's the little things in life sometimes. A good meal, a familiar song on the radio, a soft bed to sleep in after sleeping on benches and in sleeping bags for the past few weeks. That last one. It's been tainted for me after last night. I never like to think of myself as homeless. I have a beautiful home in Tampa, Florida, where my wife and kids live. It has access to the bay, a two-car garage, and a big backyard for the kids to play in. It also has my wife's new husband, the guy she married after a divorce. So I'm not... Exactly welcome there. And after the papers were finalized, I literally walked from the courthouse to the camping store. And after a $400 charge to my credit card, I felt like I had everything I needed to start my more carefree life. I thought I'd just live rough from now on, and to hell with everyone else. I would ride the rails, take day labor jobs, and just be an explorer. That's what I thought of myself, an explorer instead of a vagrant. After doing that for about five years, I've learned a few things and lost a lot of the crap I had brought with me that day long ago. I've learned which towns will ask you to leave and which towns will throw you in jail for public vagrancy. I've learned which day labor companies are willing to work with a guy who sleeps in the alleys. I've learned the best way to get showers and shave in public restrooms without attracting attention. Gyms are the best for that. But, above all else, I've learned that sometimes it's best to treat yourself when you can manage. And that's what I was doing. Trying to treat myself and get out of the heat for a night. I grew up in South Florida, so the heat was no stranger to me. I remember sleeping with the windows up 
ceiling fan on, hoping for a breeze to rustle the curtains as I stuck to my sheets. The heat doesn't bother me like it does other people, but this year, this year had been so hot. The heat wave was nearly consi- the heat was nearly constant, and I had rolled my sleeping bag up for the season and slept on a threadbare blanket on the ground most nights. I was in a rural area close to Alabama, one farm community with a short name and small population. I spent my days unloading and moving freight from the train depot and my nights trying to find a nice place to bed down. Sometimes I do day labor and sometimes I do odd jobs for people. But the police left me alone for the most part and I thank them. I thank them by not getting drunk and making a nuisance of myself. I was considering making this a regular thing for a while. Staying for a few months and renting a trailer at Happy Acres Trailer Court. But then I got word from Doris that they were downsizing a bit, and they couldn't really keep paying me under the table. Doris was a sweet 55 year old grandmother who had just been trying to make it to retirement, and she told me that she was sorry, but they were going to have to let me go. I didn't mind, I suppose. I took it as a sign that it was time to move on to somewhere else. Time to do some more exploring further north, maybe. It was getting close to harvest season, and there are plenty of little towns in Alabama or Georgia where a man can get farm labor work and a bed in a barn or a bunk in the house. It was hard work, but it was good work. And I was really hopeful as I took the small collection of cash that Dolores had collected for me and set out on the road. That whole day, though, was the hottest I'd ever experienced. I hit the road about 8 a.m. and was walking up the side of the highway by 9. It was the last week of July, and you could see the heat baking off the asphalt. The sun was high, and by 10, I was sweating as I prayed for a semi to blow past. It was a little relief when one finally did, though the air hitting my face like a giant exhaling on me. I thought longingly about the big fan running on the dock and how I could catch a long breeze between unloading and loading trains if I drove my forklift under it. By afternoon, I was miserable. My backpack felt like it weighed about 500 pounds and the straps dug into my sore shoulders. I was in Alabama I had stopped at a rest stop to use the bathroom at the border, but I was a good piece from Dorothy, the closest big city. If I could get there, I could get some day laborer or find a farmer looking for laborers for the season. I could even pick up a job at the depot or as a fry cook or something so I can afford to stay indoors until it was time to move on again. As I walked that first day, I even dared to dream that I might find something less temporary and make Dorothy my long stop. I had grown up on a farm, picking vegetables, milking cows, and taking care of horses, and the idea that I might get along with some farmer and become a stable man or his labor foreman was appealing. On the other hand, I was a lapsed accountant too. I had worked for an office in Tampa and could easily get on with a place and make that my life again. I can get an apartment. I can have a stable job again. And maybe even see my kids sometimes if they want it. Like I said, big cities are sometimes full of possibilities and there was little else to do on the road but daydream. When night fell, I was squarely in the Badlands. For those unfamiliar with Highway 98, there's a stretch before you get to Dothan, where there isn't much of anything but firework stands and little houses. There's an occasional gas station, and there's even a really nice casino out there that no one ever seems to go to. But if you're on foot and seeing it through the headlights of passing cars, it can be a little spooky. The remains of abandoned houses that are slowly being reclaimed by the land 
They look a lot like haunted houses when the lights of a passing semi-truck suddenly brings them back to life. The broken windows of a failed business seem to leer at passerbyers as many vans scream away from them. The heat was still baking up through the soles of my boots too, and I was starting to wobble a little when I finally decided to stop for the night. It was about 8 p.m., some of the pink still on the horizon. Mm, but the heat and the 12 hours of walking had me so exhausted. I had intended to move into the nearby shrubland and try to find some relief from the hot evening. But when the lighted sign appeared at the bottom of the hill, I thought it might be Providence throwing me a bone. Eddie's discount motel rotated slowly on the sign out front, and I could see the neon sign beneath that red vacancy. I had about $200 in a compartment in my backpack and about $60 in my left sock. Depending on how much of a discount Eddie's rooms were, I might find a nice bed for the evening. As I walked to the bottom of the hill, I started daydreaming again, thinking about the continental breakfast, a nice hot shower, and maybe, just maybe some HBO before settling into a real bed. I could check out around 10 and be on the road again, maybe even making dawn before dark tomorrow. I barely noticed the hot tar under my feet or the arid blast that flapped my coat when the car went by. I was on my way to something better. When the lobby doors opened, I sighed in ecstasy as the cool air hit my face. The lobby was dingy and calling it so might even be a little bit cheerful. The furniture was of the bus station variety, and there was a magazine sitting on one discussing the first term of Barack Obama. My daydreams about a continental breakfast slowly drifted away, and I approached the plexiglass booth that housed Eddie, I assume. Eddie was a middle-aged man, his hair thinning, hair pulled back in a ponytail, and his Pantera t-shirt struggled to keep him contained. Even through the glass, I thought he looked distinctly greasy. And he looked up from whatever he was watching on his laptop. Hey, I don't have any spare change, pal. I don't let people crash in the lobby either. Actually, I was wondering if I can get a room for the night. It's 30 at night. Checkouts at 10 a.m., cash up front. No refunds from stains or bugs. He tapped on the slot at the bottom of the plexiglass indicating that I should drop the cash in there. I bent down and fished out two twenties from my sock. They were wet with sweat, but money was money in this economy. Thirty was a lot to pay for a few hours of respite from the heat, but the thought of sweating out in the woods was what really made up my mind. Eddie grimaced at the wet bills, but he slid them under the counter and flopped a ten and a room key back at me. Hey. Take room 5. Don't forget, check out at 10 a.m. And don't steal my talents. He turned back to his laptop and forgot I existed. The room was somewhere between swanky and skanky. There was a bed with a sagging mattress and some sheets that were only slightly stained. A bathroom with a shower and a sadly stained toilet and a TV. The TV looked like it had seen most of the Reagan administration. All in all, it was indeed a shithole. But it was better than sleeping in the woods. The only thing I cared about was sitting under the big window. And when it started pumping out cold air at subarctic temperatures, I was glad I had shelled out for the room. The shower was amazing, but it was also the first indication I got that something was... Off. I left my clothes on the floor and climbed into the hot shower. My skin felt like I'd stepped into a hot bank for a few seconds, but it passed as the hot lava coursed down my scalp. How long had it been since I had taken a shower, or slept in a real bed, or watched TV, and I had it all to myself. My eyes snapped open though when I heard the click of nails on linoleum.
The rings on the Dollar General store curtain screamed as I yanked it hard to the side. My first thought was rats. This place was slummy enough to have them, but I didn't see anything. The floor was stained, but my clothes were the only thing on it. I looked at the door, but it was closed. No rat could have squeezed under that thing. I pulled the curtains back and had just started washing off the day's sweat when I heard it again. It was subtle, like claws on the linoleum. And when I looked at the curtain, it slammed hard against the cold plastic wall. My mind was trying to make sense of what I was seeing, but coming up short. It couldn't be what it looked like, but I couldn't find any other way to explain it. The curtains were crawling with something big. Something that looked like beetles. They were scuttling over the curtain. Four, five, seven, eight. And as I slid into the ring of the basin of the tub, I started hyperventilating. They were scuttling, their feet making the same click as I heard on the bathroom floor. I couldn't see their eyes, but I could feel them. They glared at me through the curtains as the steam clouded around me. As the water fell on my head, I gasped in pain as the shampoo had been working its way into my scalp and ran into my eyes. I wiped at it, not wanting to lose track of the bug, but as my vision cleared, I was looking at an empty space. The bugs were gone, out of sight, but definitely not out of mind. I searched a room and probably looked ridiculous in my underoos, but I never found anything. Well, except for the stains on the mattress. They were a little hard to miss. I had gripped the mattress when I saw an old red stain on the sides. If you'd never seen old blood, you may not realize what it looks like. But I had seen my fair share on the farm. This, this was old blood. Probably years old. Those bugs were still fresh in my mind, and as I laid on top of the comforter, I couldn't help but wonder where they had gotten off to. Were they waiting for me to turn off the lights? Were they sitting in the drain? As some movie played in the background, I found my eyes straying to the corners of the dingy room. The corners were dark despite the lights being on, and I felt something lurking there. I fidgeted restlessly on the bed as something scrambled over my leg, but I couldn't find anything when I lifted my leg up. I was being paranoid. Where did I care if the room had roaches or beetles or whatever? I had often slept next to a dumpster or out in the middle of the woods. Just because these bugs had startled me didn't mean they were out to hurt me. Despite my better judgment, I got under the covers and tried to get comfortable. The mattress was lumpy, but not too bad. There was a definite divot in the middle. A person's shaped indent worn from multiple bodies over multiple years. It seemed to be my only choice for a sleeping location. It wasn't a chasm or anything. I had uncomfortable dips on either side. I finally found myself giving up and laying in it. And as my eyes started to slip shut, I felt the bite. It wasn't hard. A little less than an ant bite. But it snapped me out of my semi-sleep and made me throw the covers back to look. I checked the bed, the sheets giving away nothing. And I couldn't find any ants, spiders, or anything. I thought about bed bugs then and pulled my jeans back to look at the bite. It was nothing. A little red spot. But as I tried to settle again, I felt another bite. It was followed by a third, a fourth, and a fifth in seconds. I could feel something on my skin, little feet running up my legs, and the bites were painful. I rolled up my jeans and swatted at my legs, but there was nothing there. It was as though whatever had bitten me had taken a chomp and left just as quick. I was back on the comforter in a flash, but the divot, it felt tainted. I sat on the left side, my shoulder against the wall as I put my back to the headboard. Just wishing I had put up with the heat, 
I could just leave, I thought. This was America, after all. And if I wanted to waste my money, then that was my business. The thought of going back outside and sleeping in the woods, the heat folding over me like a blanket, this was not at all appealing. But I didn't like the thought of bugs crawling on me either. Especially not bed bugs. Growing up, my parents had been fond of bringing the dogs inside. And I could remember spending nights with fleas crawling all over me as I sweated beneath the sheets. We had bed bugs a few times as well. And I remember sleepless nights spent as they crawled and bit me. It had led me to be very neat. Something that persisted into my homelessness. And it was almost funny that I hadn't felt truly dirty until coming inside for the night. It wasn't a big problem though. Bugs don't like the cold. And I had the AC on at 65. I could sleep on the comforter, avoid the worst of the bites, and still enjoy a nice cool evening indoors before returning to the heat tomorrow. When the power suddenly went off in my room, plunging me into darkness, I felt a moan rise from my throat of its own will. I was left with nothing but my own breathing as I sat on the saggy bed. The curtain windows provided nothing but a ghostly inkling of shadowy light from the parking lot beyond. I crossed my arms around my chest as I began to shudder. The cold air hung around me like a cloud but would soon dissolve before long. Then, well, I might as well have slept outside. The heat was so oppressive, but at least the bugs were a little less forward. As I sat in the dark, I felt like I could hear something scuttling again. It was clicking. The noise scuttled across my brain. I looked around anxiously, trying to see where they were coming from. I wanted to run. I wanted to get the hell out of there. But I just couldn't make my legs move. My eyes were roving in panic when I saw the comforter begin to flutter. The divot made a little canyon in the bedclothes, and I could see something swimming up from that hole. They were big, looking like the beetles from the kids' cartoon, and they came staggering up in the center as they ruffled the comforter. They spread out as they searched for me, and I felt my fear growing as the wave began to flow my way. They were like a squad of army ants, making their uniform patrol as they looked for prey. And as they came towards me, I did the only thing I can think to do. I got up, and I made a run for the door. I made a grab for my pack, but my fingers, my fingers slipped off the rawhide loop at the top. I paused at the doorway, turning back to grab it, and that's when I saw them. The bugs on the shower curtain had been babies compared to these bloodsuckers. They were as large as dogs. Their amber bodies clicked as they moved. Their piss yellow eyes full of hate. They came lumbering after me, their antennas quivering with anticipation. I slammed the doors and left the bag to them. I had a fleeting thought that I had left the room key on the nightstand. But that hardly mattered. I would have gone in there for $2,000 much less the $200 and change left in my travel sack. That's how I ended up running up the interstate towards Dothan, with nothing but the clothes on my back and $10 in my sock. I must have looked pretty silly, but I didn't care. I was glad to be out of there, glad to be in the muggy air, and happy to have escaped with my life. And when the man in the farm truck picked me up about 30 minutes later, I was glad. I was glad to be able to feel the breeze that ruffled my hair as I sat in the back. It was better than any cold blast from Eddie's air conditioner could ever be. Whenever I get wanderlust again, I just think back to the night three years ago and count myself lucky to have what I have now. It turns out that Dothan had some of the things I was looking for and some other things I hadn't even thought of. I found work. I found a place to stay that wasn't a park bench. And when the farmer had hired out to pick pecans without a pecans, the farmer was already having me work on his books and help get his finances back in order. I moved into a little rental on his land. 
And I'm glad to say that my wandering days are over now. I put the story here as a warning for those. Eddie's prices may seem like a deal, but watch out for the things you get on top of the bed and TV. Those bed bugs have teeth. Eddie may just end up as another stain on the mattress if you aren't careful.